Good morning to everybody joining us from Washington, D.C. in the United States, and good afternoon to everybody joining us from Europe, and particularly Switzerland, which is where our guests come from today. We're here to talk about Strategic Trends 2023, which is a wide-ranging report from our Swiss sister think tank in a lot of ways. A few of the key takeaways from this really outstanding report. Uh, number one, we are headed toward a more disordered world as Russia and China vie for what they see as their rightful place defining the future. That competition will be a world safe for democracy versus a world safe for autocracy. We're going to talk about that with Brian here in just a minute. Uh, number two, in this world, allies and partners are critical. This report examines how those partnerships translate to both technology and to nuclear issues. We'll talk about that some more in a minute, too. And then finally, a big question, what is the role of India? It's a state that was once closely aligned with the USSR, then non-aligned, and now omni-aligned in a lot of ways. It wants to act as a bridge between other great powers. It's growing more strategically aligned with the United States, but what do these trends really mean? What does that mean for the world? What does it mean for India? So we're gonna go through each one of these different topics during the next hour or so uh, with my guests. And first, joining me here in person, um, we have from the Center for Security Studies in Zurich, Brian, Car Brian Carlson, I'm so sorry. Yours is actually the easiest name of the three that I have to pronounce, but we'll get there. Uh, he is the head of the global security team and has a PhD from SAIS, which is right down the road. Uh, we feature many members of our faculty here who are also on faculty at SAIS. Uh, we also have Naveen Shapers, who is the co-team head and senior researcher in Swiss and Euro-Atlantic security team. And we have Boas Lieberherr, who is the senior researcher on the global security team. And we're going to go through and do a brief presentation by each one of our guests on the chapters that they wrote for this report. And then we'll do Q&A from the audience. And I have a few of my own questions. So if you would like to submit a question, please go to the link online. And they will pop up here on my iPad. And we will have a conversation with our guests. So first, Brian, I would like to turn to you to talk a little bit about the report in general, and then also your chapter on this world order question. Thank you, Emily, and thank you very much to CSIS for hosting us today. Strategic Trends 2023 appeared just a couple of weeks ago. It's our flagship annual publication at the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich. And it's the third time I've been editor and a contributor. And um, very pleased with the lineup we have th uh, this year and happy that uh, three of the authors can be here. We also have a chapter by Sophie Charlotte Fisher on U.S. efforts to implement uh, tech export controls on China and efforts to get allied support for those efforts, which are crucial in order for them to be a su uh, successful uh, endeavor. And so, uh, unfortunately, Sophie isn't here today, but uh, I, th I think she wrote an excellent chapter, and so I encourage everyone to have a look at that. It was an excellent chapter. It was a chapter that was one of those well-written pieces that takes a hugely technical <coughs> subject and makes it approachable for somebody who doesn't understand the issue in depth. So I would commend that to anybody who wants to learn the complex world of chips. Thank you, and she's uh, enjoying a well-earned vacation in Asia right now, so that's why <laughs> yeah. she can't be here with us. So I'll, I'll speak a little bit about my chapter, uh, which deals with China, Russia, and the future of world order. Um, my research focuses mostly on China-Russia relations, and in the past couple of issues, I focused on security implications of this relationship for Europe and for Asia. This year, I <clears throat> decided to take a broader view on uh, world order. I think that uh, shared or similar views on world order have been a, a major driver of the China-Russia partnership going back for decades now. And these issues are especially prominent now, of course, with Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine, China's posture toward Taiwan, and also in a number of recent joint statements that China and Russia have issued. Uh, this includes the famous February 4th, 2022 joint declaration in which the two countries not only declared that they had a no-limits friendship, but also outlined many of their shared views on world order. And then we saw similar statements in the recent declaration that they issued during Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow in March. And on that occasion, Xi repeated the comment that he often makes, saying that the world is undergoing changes unseen in a century. And this time he added that we, China and Russia, are driving those changes together. So these uh, issues are, are very prominent right now. <clears throat> in the chapter, I look at China and Russia both individually and together. And so I'll just say a little bit about the two countries in turn uh, at first. Uh, 
Uh, China and Russia pose challenges to the existing world order in different ways based on differences in their status and role in the international system. China is a potential peer competitor of the United States, and it supports certain aspects of the existing world order, but also seeks to revise the world order in ways that uh, conform more closely to what they see as, as their interests. And they could eventually gain the power to make significant revisions to the world order. Uh, Russia, on the other hand, has no realistic chance of regaining its former superpower status. It tries to reestablish or establish itself as an independent great power in the world, and it acts as a disruptive force in the international system. And so these uh, differences are captured in the Biden administration's national security strategy released last year, which says that Russia poses an immediate threat to the free and open international system. Uh, whereas China is the only competitor with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to advance that objective. Or as some of my former RAND colleagues put it a little bit more pithily in a, in a report from a few years ago, Russia is a rogue, not a peer. China is a peer, not a rogue. Yeah, that's, that's a great line. That's yeah. a nice little synopsis of, of the way it works, yep. I wish I could claim credit for <laughs> it, but unfortunately I can only cite it secondhand. Uh, but th those are some basic differences in the approaches of the two countries. <clears throat> I'll go into a little bit more detail now about each of them. Uh, China, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, appears to be taking steps both to revise or, and reshape the regional order in East Asia and to revise the world order more generally. So in, in East Asia, China aims to reduce the U.S. influence and presence and weaken the U.S. alliance network, and it aims to place itself at the head of a regional hierarchy and, and basically establish a sphere of influence there. Uh, its recent statements and actions in the past few years also suggest broader ambitions to revise the, the world order. Uh, Xi Jinping has spoken about China taking center stage in the world and becoming a, 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 a global power in, in, in terms of comprehensive national power in the, in the, in the coming decades. And uh, China is pursuing this aim by building partnerships around the world. Russia is its most important partner in challenging the United States and the U.S.-led order. Uh, but China is also cultivating countries in the global south uh, through a variety of initiatives, including the, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Global Development, Security, and Civilizational Initiatives that have been announced in recent years. The goal is to build a, a loose coalition of countries in the Global South and other parts of the world that don't uh, fully, don't accept the idea of a U.S.-led international order and are willing to cooperate with China in certain respects. So we see this in China's role in brokering the deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia recently and in cultivating Brazil, as on President Lula's recent visit to China. So these are examples of this approach. And China also aims to be um, a, a, a country that uh, plays a key role in setting norms and rules and standards in the world, including in the digital sphere, which is crucial for the future. Russia has taken a number of uh, different actions in recent years to try to revise the world order as well. Of course, its aggression against Georgia and Ukraine have been motivated in large part by a desire to prevent those countries from moving into Western institutions such as NATO and the European Union. And uh, so in that way, Russia opposes the idea of a, a liberal international order. It has also pursued Eurasian integration uh, with the goal of making itself a, a major power in Eurasia, which would make it a, a great power in the world. So it's pursued this uh, goal through the Eurasian Economic Union and the Collective Security Treaty Organization and, and so forth. And it's also strengthened its partnerships with BRICS countries, especially China, as a way to gain greater leverage in the international system. So this is uh, Russia's basic approach. Now, if, if we look at the two countries together, uh, as I said, I think that <clears throat> similar views on world order have been a, a major driver of this relationship. And China and Russia share a number of key objectives. Uh, above all, they want to reduce the power of the United States and oppose the idea of a U.S.-led international order. They want to bring a definitive end to the era of unipolarity and usher in a, a new era of multipolarity. They've been talking about that in joint declarations going back more than 25 years now. Both of them aim to establish their own spheres of influence in their own regions. 
and they're keenly interested in regime security, and so they support each other on this objective. And they op oppose universal claims for democracy and human rights, which they see as part of efforts by the United States and other liberal democracies to undermine their governing regimes. And so all of these issues and more, also the desire to reduce the, value, uh, the, the role of the U.S. dollar in the international economy, these and other issues drive them together and promote cooperation. Now, over time, they could potentially diverge on certain issues related to world order. So, for example, on the issue of multipolarity, it seems clear that this really is Russia's objective. They really do want a multipolar world because only in a multipolar world can Russia reestablish itself as a, a great power. It can't be a great power in a, a U.S. unipolar world or a, a U.S.-China bipolar world. It needs a true multipolar order. And China says for now that it supports multipolarity, but it's unclear whether this is really its vision for the long run. It may have uh, in mind something that looks more like a Sinocentric world order over time in which Russia would, would be marginalized. And <clears throat> the two countries could come into conflict over the issue of spheres of influence. Uh, China is uh, becoming more influential in Central Asia and Russia appears to be losing some influence there. I just returned from a trip to Central Asia sponsored by the U.S. State Department, and this was a, a frequent topic of conversation there. Mm -hmm. And China later this week will have a, a China-Central Asia summit in Xi'an to, uh, to discuss uh, China's approach to the region, and we might see some new initiatives. So that's uh, potentially a concern for Russia. China could, <clears throat> could also press its interests in the Arctic in ways that would uh, not be to uh, Russia's advantage in terms of its desire to be the dominant power there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, the Russian Far East and Siberia could become uh, more and more dependent on China over time economically and um, in terms of, of Chinese influence there. So those are all ways in which expanding Chinese spheres of influence could encroach on Russia's interests. And also China's a desire to establish a, a sphere of influence in Asia <clears throat> could reduce Russia's diplomatic flexibility. China might be in a position, for example, to demand that, that Russia reduce support and provision of weapons and so forth to countries like India and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, so all of these are ways that uh, China and Russia and their views of world order could come into conflict over the long run. <clears throat> but I would emphasize that for the foreseeable future, they're likely to continue to cooperate very closely because uh, their shared views on world order and especially their desire to oppose the idea of a US-led international order give them a lot of scope for cooperation as we've seen in the continued partnership that they've maintained throughout Russia's war in Ukraine. So I'm gonna interrupt you there and take the moderator's uh, prerogative to ask one clarifying question. Sure. The the Russia-China relationship at the moment to me seems unbalanced. It seems mm -hmm. like the power is very much in the hands of China. Do you think that Russia really understands what this partnership is and what China wants to get out of Russia? And what do you think Russia hopes for in the partnership with China? I think they're pretty clear-eyed about it for the near term uh, and for the foreseeable future. I think that um, I think Russia clearly is becoming more dependent on China. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been true at least since 2014 with the, at, at the time of the annexation of Crimea. And since the war began uh, more than a year ago, that process has accelerated. Uh, there are reports that after 2014, the Russian government did an interagency review of policy toward China, and they determined that they didn't face a near-term threat from China. Mm -hmm. And so they had scope in the near term to work with China in order to gain more leverage in the international system. So they recognize that there's a, a potential problem with becoming more dependent on China, but they're kind of pushing that problem into the future. And, uh, but, but China also needs Russia in, in a lot of ways. I think the Chinese view is that the, the US-China rivalry is intensifying and China needs friends and they don't have any better friend than, than Russia in terms of what Russia can provide, energy, arms, uh, a friendly neighbor along a, a long border to their north and, and support in challenging the U.S.-led international order. Mm -hmm. And so for all these reasons, China has a strong incentive to provide reassurance to Russia and not antagonize it. Uh, but over time, as China gains more leverage in that relationship, they may be tempted to make greater demands. And right. so that could cause some friction in the relationship. Right. 
Thank you for letting me distract you. Sure, no problem. <laughs> so I'll just uh, conclude with a few brief comments on the future of world order. We could be entering a, a period in which the world order will be defined largely by the U.S.-China rivalry and by uh, groups that both countries lead for purposes of security competition with the other. So it could basically be the United States and its allies and partners on one side and uh, China on the other with Russia as its most important partner, perhaps followed by a diverse grouping of countries from the global south and, and other parts of the world. So that could uh, could define the, the world order in, in the coming period. And so uh, I would say that if, as, if this kind of situation takes shape, uh, the idea of a liberal international order uh, retains a lot of value. Uh, the idea has taken a beating in recent years for, for reasons that we're all familiar with. And it's not, the liberal international order is not likely to expand geographically in the foreseeable future. But if we envision the liberal international order as primarily cooperation among the liberal democracies, uh, I think that still has great value for, for the purpose of, uh, as Emily said at the outset, making this, the world safe for democracy. Uh, first Britain, later the United States, benefited tremendously from leadership of a liberal order dating back more than 300 years now. And the liberal democracies are still responsible for a majority of global GDP and military spending. And so liberal democracy still has great value in terms of uh, generating the economic growth that improves people's lives and, and builds the, the foundation for military power. And it also, <clears throat> I think, has the, still has the potential to demonstrate to the world that it, it's a better model than what China and Russia can offer. And so there are some real advantages in cooperation among the, the liberal democracies. I think that the, the Biden administration's conception of a, a struggle between democracies and autocracies therefore captures an important part of the reality, but not the whole reality, because the United States will also have to cooperate with a number of other countries. Uh, first of all, non-democracies that are concerned about security threats from China, like Vietnam, and also with a country like India, which my co colleague Boaz will discuss in just a moment, which of course is a democracy, but has suffered some democratic backsliding in recent years and is not enthusiastic about the idea of democracies versus autocracies or a liberal international order, as we see in India's reluctance to put pressure on Russia over the war in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's sort of, um, there's uh, U.S. cooperation with liberal democracies that's an important core of the future efforts on world order, cooperation with a broader range of countries that don't fit in that framework, and then there still has to be cooperation in what some scholars have called a, a thin international order involving all countries of the world in trying to address problems that are common to humanity. And this will be very difficult <clears throat> to achieve, but it would, it would involve cooperation on issues such as climate change and global public health and financial stability, arms control, nuclear nonproliferation. The United States and the Soviet Union managed to cooperate on arms control and global public health and other issues during the Cold War. And so there will have to be similar efforts during the coming period, which will be much more complicated than the Cold War because of the, the close economic linkages between China and the liberal democracies. And so, uh, it will be very hard to achieve this kind of cooperation. And we're going through a period now in which the United States and China are talking a little bit, and the United States is, is in particular is looking for ways to ease tensions in the relationship, but they're encountering some reluctance from China. So it, it will be, be very difficult to achieve this kind of cooperation, but given the uh, challenges that these problems pose, the effort will be necessary. So that was um, a, a bit of the reason for this chapter. Switzerland is, um, a, a, a temporary, a, a member of the, a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council this year and next year. So uh, this report partly informs uh, the Swiss government on the approach that they can take at the United Nations, but I would say given the uh, developments in world order, multilateralism and efforts at the UN will be uh, very difficult during the period in which Switzerland is, is a member. So I'll leave it there. I haven't said much about the war in Ukraine, uh, but I'm happy to discuss that in the Q&A. Right, there are huge implications for everything you outlined in this chapter for the war in Ukraine.
Um, I love that in this chapter, you went for no smaller a topic than the world order. Uh, and you, you tackled a ton of really weighty concepts, some of which reminded me of my IR 101 classes, you know, what is the definition of a liberal world order? Uh, and you, you kind of wrestle with that definition a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about, you know, what it should and shouldn't be. And I hope that during the Q&A, we get to the three scenarios that you lay out, okay. um, which may have been one of the most depressing parts of the report. Uh, none of those are good news. Uh, but for now, um, speaking of really good news. Uh, let's talk about nukes and <laughs> let's talk about uh, global alliances. Uh, Naveen, I will turn it over to you to talk about your chapter. Thank you very much. Just checking first if you can all hear me. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, excellent. So first, thank you very much uh, to the CSIS for having us join uh, both in person and on Zoom. Um, and thank you uh, to Julia and to you, Emily, for organizing. I'm delighted to join a friendly virtually. So my chapter titled uh, Alliances and Extended Nuclear Deterrence in Europe and Asia discusses extended nuclear deterrence practices and their different forms of implementation by the United States in Europe and the Asia Pacific at a time <laughs> when nuclear risks are rising in both regions and the need to reassure allies is quite strong. So in it, I try to untangle the different alliance systems so uh, and the extended deterrence uh, applications focusing on NATO in Europe and then the formal cases of Japan, South Korea and Australia in the Asia Pacific. Um, and then I try to examine the linkages between both, so how they're then becoming more entangled. So the main trend uh, identified here is sort of twofold. So first, a bleak security environment and rising nuclear threats in both regions are placing a very strong emphasis on extended nuclear deterrence within alliance relationships, leading to then long-term strategic, political and financial decisions for allies to trust in and to build on their alliance relationship with the United States and the nuclear security guarantee that it provides. And second, then is also becoming increasingly challenging for the United States to then deter two major nuclear powers, Russia and China at the same time, in addition to threats posed by North Korea in an environment that is pretty much nearly devoid of guardrails in terms of nuclear arms control, even including risk reduction measures at the moment. So in the next uh, few minutes, I just wanted to provide maybe a little bit of background on extended nuclear deterrence, then bring us back to that current context and the identified trend before providing a, a brief outlook. Um, so to provide first a bit of a background, while we are now seeing the emergence of the Belarus case with Russia, and so a Russian case of extended nuclear deterrence, the US-centered alliance system and that extended nuclear deterrence commitment it provides to allies remains very much unique in its geographical scope, resilience, the range of frameworks, and then the level of engagement it has with allies. And so this nuclear umbrella, as we most often uh, refer to it, is in essence pretty much the same for US treaty-based allies. It's a commitment to come to an ally's defense, including through nuclear means if deemed necessary. And this requires both adversaries and allies to believe in the credibility of this commitment, uh, with allies generally being the ones that are a bit more difficult to convince in that case than adversaries. But what is then different between the alliances uh, is the operationalization of that commitment. So in Asia, deterrence, nuclear deterrence is provided solely through the independent strategic nuclear forces of the United States, while in Europe, in the NATO context, these are then supplemented by the independent forces of France and the United Kingdom, as well as uh, nuclear sharing arrangements with US forward deployed nuclear weapons to six European bases, and then the European host nations providing the dual capable aircraft and air force personnel to support these nuclear missions. So the NATO nuclear sharing arrangements have definitely called for a level of information sharing and consultation within the Alliance and allied participation through conventional means in nuclear operation exercises that does not yet at least exist to the, the same extent with Japan, South Korea, or Australia, and would also be quite difficult to replicate exactly in that context. So back to today now, the war 
in Europe, the prospect of dealing with escalation scenarios involving nuclear threats in Asia have this provided then this new appeal, this new emphasis for extended nuclear deterrence arrangements in a context where there were sometimes, I'm thinking of particular countries in NATO or Japan or even Australia, where it wasn't necessarily that popular to talk about uh, nuclear deterrence. So in Europe, we've seen this translated to, of course, expanding NATO membership uh, and the nuclear umbrella provided, which is clearly a step up from a, a security <laughs> assurance and a clear distinction then being made between the formal guarantee and the security assurance. So to Finland, of course, who has now joined NATO and eventually to Sweden when it joins, there's also been a new urgency provided and just a fastening of the process for the modernization of the dual uh, capable aircrafts in host countries. And in Asia, we've seen more political and public debates on the involvement in extended nuclear deterrence mechanisms, as well as uh, an emphasis on also conventional means used to complement uh, extended nuclear deterrence. The timeline that is outlined in the um, 2022 US national security strategy uh, says that by the 2030s already, the United States will for the first time in its history face two major nuclear powers as strategic competitors and potential adversaries. So this of course changes the deterrence calculus for the US and has implications for strategy, for false posture, but also for alliances. So for the US, this places a strain on the geographically stretched out alliance commitments, creates challenges in terms of ensuring allies, in terms of balancing their requests for involvement or more involvement, further visibility of particular assets, and also in terms of offering persuasive arguments at home uh, on nuclear security guarantees. And then for allies, this requires a better understanding of how their main security provider has to balance these different deterrence requirements and different regions, how extended nuclear deterrence also varies in its implementation and why one model is not necessarily adapted to all allies. So recently we've had a very clear example of that with the uh, Washington Declaration that was signed only a few weeks ago after, of course, our publication was already out. So <laughs> events happen quickly. But so uh, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol visited uh, the United States uh, in late April. And so in signing this Washington Declaration, uh, established uh, with the United States a new nuclear consultative group where nuclear and strategic planning can be discussed. There's been just various new elements for how to strengthen the deterrence relationship between the United States and South Korea, which is happening after the last few months when where we've seen a lot of discontent and very political debates in South Korea about um, involvement in extended deterrence mechanisms or even if those don't work, going fully for a domestic option. So this has very much been on the mind. And what is clearly not being said by the Washington Declaration uh, is that the US is not is clearly not going to be forward deploying nuclear weapons to Korea or creating any sort of nuclear sharing system that exists within NATO, uh, which is what a lot of uh, policy and even expert circles in South Korea, I think we're advocating for for some time. So I think seeing there a, a bit of a recent example of how uh, this is these debates are shifting uh, and uh, progress is being made uh, in allied countries. So the prospect of the US fa facing these two major nuclear adversaries in the midterm also requires allies to establish where and how they can compensate conventionally for gaps that exist or will appear. So AUKUS and Australia's procurement program for nuclear power, conventionally armed submarines is an example there. And it also requires allies to see how they can better coordinate and perhaps even cooperate with each other. So there we're seeing a stre strengthening of defense cooperation between allies in the same region. Um, Japan and Australia, for instance, are upping quite a bit their defense cooperation, an important mending of relations in the same region as well between Japan and South Korea. And also just an increasing dialogue between NATO and Asia Pacific countries. So uh, the NATO Asia Pacific four format in particular offers a lot of possibilities there, including at the official and expert levels. But so far, these discussions have not really yet addressed uh, 
nuclear risks or risk reduction dialogue. So that's a, an element that's uh, still to be explored. This brings me then to my last sort of outlook and uncertainties part. Um, these developments, as I mentioned, the Washington Declaration being signed uh, very, only very recently, um, there's just a, been a lot of key strategic decisions that are happening quickly. This is not happening in a vacuum, but the fact that this is all happening rather fast, there is that risk of missing some steps, notably some public debates and consultations, uh, which uh, could eventually come back. I think here I'm thinking of Sweden's NATO decision in particular, or even some elements about the finan financing of AUKUS in Australia. That's something where some risk there. There's also some further repercussions uh, of a refocus solely on deterrence policies without there being any progress on arms control or even on disarmament that can be expected. So domestically, having all these deterrence only debates in countries that have long been very uncomfortable with uh, having these debates uh, is something that I think uh, policy circles need to take into account. Um, this also probably has implications for in the mid to long term uh, with, within the nuclear non-proliferation treaty regime where further polarization can then very much be expected. Um, there's also a limit to increased cooperation and alignment between NATO and Asia Pacific states. Um, there's only so much that can be discussed, like I think that increased awareness and increased dialogue and exchange and practices works, but at some point it still always goes through the United States. Uh, and this particular rapprochement is also what China fears a lot. China really fears the replication of any sort of NATO uh, nuclear sharing arrangement in Asia. And so even if this is not really on the table, discussions around just generally further coordination is uh, not really taken well. And so there's this risk of China becoming more of a the center in uh, multilateral regimes and also causing further uh, coordination and cooperation between Russia and China. Although we've seen also recently that there's limits to that as well, at least on nuclear rhetoric in particular. Um, the last element I would just mention uh, is that while in the last few years we've seen a lot of efforts from the Biden administration to restore um, credibility in the U.S. as a security provider, uh, all allied states are, of course, watching and fearing and uh, seeing what will happen with the next election cycle. And so there's always this perception that things can turn around, even if so far we've seen a lot of resilience and uh, trust in the U.S. as an ally. And I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, you really worked through some complex and high stakes dynamics in this chapter. Um, and it was a an interesting and, and truly troubling read. There was one line on page 76 in particular that I wanted to highlight talking about the dynamics making this question much more pressing in the last year. You say, as a result of Russia's war of aggression, the subsequent breakdown of arms control discussions between the U.S. and Russia, closer relations between Russia and China, the intensification oh, get my pages, and acceleration of Chinese nuclear buildup, as well as North Korea, at a smaller but increasingly dangerous scale. And I wrote in the margin, oh, is that all? It's <laughs> such a combination of, of things that we're facing. Um, but you do point out the importance of the alliances and how the alliances can help us face all of these truths. So we will come back to all of that in the questions. Uh, but now I will turn it over to Boaz to talk about India. And I confess, of all the things in this report, India is the, the subject that I know the least about. And so I felt like I learned so much from reading your chapter. And everything about India is eye-popping. Every number that you included in this uh, section of the report just made my jaw drop. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to your briefing. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having us. And we are, Naveen and I are joining from very, very rainy and cold Switzerland. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's just like to describe the environment uh, here. Um, we have already heard from Brian how uh, China, Russia and the United States dominate, dominate the current debate about the future of the international order. But there is another actor, of course, that is uh, likely to have an impact on the global balance of power, and that is India. Some well-known facts, India is a nuclear weapon state. It has the third largest military spending in the world. Uh, India has to become the most populous country in, in this year. And it also might become the world's third largest economy by, by the end of this decade. Mm 
So for all these reasons, India has the potential to be a regional counterweight to China. And it, and it is exactly in this context that India has grown closer to the United States and its allies and partners over the last 15 years, while relations with China have reached a low point since the escalation of the border tensions in 2020. However, India's abstentions uh, or, or abstention from various UN votes to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine has raised questions about New Delhi's foreign policy direction. Also, India's conception of global order are in some way closer to those of China and Russia than to those of the United States. And at the same time, as an important member of the Quad, India's status and agency in negotiating the rules for a free and open Indo-Pacific is increasing. So the purpose of my chapter was to put all this in context and to outline how India navigates a world in transition. And I will uh, use the next couple of minutes to provide a broad overview of India's foreign policy in, in the past, uh, in the present and in the future. And I will focus not only on India's relations with their major powers, but also on the domestic and the regional context where actually India's greatest challenges appear to lie. So looking into the past, at the end of the Cold War, India shifted from, from non-alignment to a foreign policy called multi-alignment or strategic autonomy. The demise of its longtime ally, the Soviet Union, and also a balance of, of payment crisis forced New Delhi to change its foreign policy, both dramatically and also reluctantly. It started to seek integration into the global economy to end its um, regional strategic isolation in South Asia and also to improve its relations with the United States and its allies. So what are the differences between these two approaches? Non-alignment was an attempt to minimize costs and risk associated with being a weak power. And multi-alignment is, is rather a quest for security and status as an emerging major power, while also trying to avoid too uh, great dependence on any major power. This approach it is, is less ideological. It, all, it is also less uh, anti-Western than, than non-alignment has been. What has remained unchanged since independence is, is India's flexibility to tilt selectively toward a major power depending on external circumstances. However, in this or India's physical proximity to China is likely to limit its room for maneuver to some extent in, in this regard. So shifting away from this rather uh, conceptual discussion to the present and how does India's foreign policy operates today at the, at the national, the regional, and the international level. And three overarching trends can be identified. The first one on the domestic level is that India's main foreign policy objective and also its greatest limitation remains domestic, economic, and social development. So first and foremost, India seeks partners to achieve this goal and all its aspirations to become a more influential global actor hinges on how it tackles these challenges. And in this regard, you or there are people or observers who are more optimistic and others that are a little bit more pessimistic. India uh, is expected to be the fastest growing economy in the coming years, but still hundreds of millions of people uh, live in poverty. 22% of India's population cannot read or write and the projected GDP growth is also likely to prove insufficient to create enough jobs for the millions of, of young people who enter the labor market each year. There are structural reasons uh, for this, for instance, a large and a unproductive agricultural sector and a financial sector in need of reform. So India has, al has already achieved many successes in the past in the fight against poverty, but the challenges ahead, they remain great. The second trend on, on the regional level is that China's rise complicates New Delhi's regional environment significantly. Several observers, observers argue that India is, is losing influence vis-a-vis -vis China in its neighborhoods and India's trade and connectivity linkages with its smaller neighbors have only begun to, to grow in recent decades. And this is also, uh, again, a Cold War legacy. And 
today India is doing more than ever in absolute terms. It has stepped up diplomatic engagement, financial and humanitarian assistance. It has accelerated the work on con connectivity, but with competition from China, expectations and demands are rising as well. And against this backdrop and in contrast to the past, India is seeking the support of external powers uh, by building partnerships to, to counter China's growing influence in the region, while in the past India uh, tried to keep external powers out uh, of the neighborhood. The third level, uh, or the third trend at the global level is, uh, as already touched upon, India is moving closer to the United States while continuing to, to diversify its relations with countries such as Australia, Israel, Japan, Iran, Saudi Arabia. As you know much better than I do, India's relations with the United States have been on a clear upward trajectory for over 15 years now. There has been an increase in defense consultations, in military to military co collaboration, and also the United States stake in India's defense market um, is growing. However, the two countries are far from aligning on all issues. There remain major differences, uh, for instance, on trade, on immigration, also on larger strategic issues. India believes that the current international order is skewed in favor of the United States and its allies, and it calls, for instance, for reform of the UN Security Council and also for better representation in other multilateral institutions, such as the IMF. India's relations with China went in the uh, in the opposite direction, the border clashes in 2020 marked a watershed moment in the bilateral relations. India seems not willing to go back to business as usual and is, it has also abandoned its reluctance to take a more conf confrontational stance towards China. However, India is likely to be interested in a partial normalization of relations as soon as a suitable opportunity arises. And two uh, points are important here. First, China is India's second largest trading partner, only recently overtaken by the United States. And secondly, the current situation along the shared border places an additional burden on India's already uh, strained, uh, limited or strained military budget. And this comes at a time when India is looking to build up its capabilities in the Indian Ocean as the competition with China uh, is growing also in this domain. And it is interesting that India, despite the current confrontation along the border, uh, is the only country in the Quad that remains uncomfortable with, with more hard security aspects of the grouping and prefers to focus instead on, on softer or on softer security issues. Russia's importance uh, in India's strategic calculation has steadily declined since the ends of the Cold War and Russia's war in Ukraine will further accelerate this trend. However, Russia is and will remain an important partner for India for the foreseeable future. More than two thirds of India's defense equipment is, is of Soviet and Russian uh, origin. And uh, over the last year, Russia has also become India's uh, main oil supplier. And as a last point here, New Delhi also fears a uncontrolled Russia-China axis if it were to distance its, itself further from Moscow. Uh, so the prospect of, of India's main defense supplier, Russia, and its main adversary, China moving closer together that could seriously complicate India's strategic environment. Looking ahead, looking into the future, uh, there are opportu opportunities and challenges uh, for India's aspiration to remain an independent, self-reliant pole. On the one hand, India is likely to play an important role in negotiating the future framework for a free and open Indo-Pacific, and its ideas of order will gain more influence. On the other hand, the more pressing the China or the China-Russia challenge becomes, the more India will be forced uh, to cut back on its strategic autonomy. Lastly, to zoom out a little bit, um, it is important to note that significant differences regarding ideas of order remain between India and the United States and its allies. 
to link again to, to Brian's uh, presentation, India shares similar views with China and Russia in rejecting U.S. Un unipolarity and also in the support of multipolarity. India's position on freedom of navigation, for instance, is also closer to that of China than to that of the United States. And even though India has adopted the terminology of a rules-based order, its understanding of the term differs significantly from that of the United States. What does this mean for the Indo-Pacific? This does not mean, of course, that India and China are likely to soon put aside their differences and seek a sustainable rapprochement, but that negotiating what a free and open Indo-Pacific means in practice will be a complicated and diffuse process. And this process will be characterized by a combination of disputes over specific rules and norms in the Quad, but also by omissions of important issues on which agreement is, is unlikely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, really fascinating stuff. So I'm going to ask you one question right off the bat about one of those eye-popping numbers. 45% um, of the population of India lived below the poverty line in 2019, so pre-pandemic. If you have any updates to those numbers for now, I don't want to exactly call it post-pandemic, but coming out of the pandemic, I'd be curious to hear it. And that feeds into one of the more central points of your chapter, which is that economic and social development is by far India's first priority. And that manifests itself in ways like buying Russian oil at a steep discount when the rest of the world is trying to shut Russia's economy off from the world markets. So can you talk a little bit about that dynamic and how that economic and social development as by far the first priority really informs India's foreign policy? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, regarding the first part, so uh, this uh, this, port, this poverty line or uh, with which these uh, over 400 million are measured, this is a, uh, the poverty line of middle income countries. And uh, if India uh, counts is, uh, it, the people that live be below its poverty line, this poverty line is, is likely to be lower and it would come to uh, fewer people who live in poverty. So as India is uh, counted as a middle income country, uh, this uh, uh, this poverty line of I don't know three point something dollars mm -hmm. uh, would apply, and then you to you uh, come to this number. And uh, I think India's um, India's work in in challenging and and f fighting back against poverty and reducing poverty has has taken a setback uh, during uh, uh, during the pandemic. So. Uh, there have been uh, the, the informal sector in, in, in India is large and there also unemployment uh, has been increasing and it uh, it will it will be a challenge uh, to, to to reduce this and uh, and India's uh, yeah aspirations to reduce these uh, these figures will uh, will have to go uh, a long way and as you have have uh, hinted at India has, uh, for instance, justified its its increasing oil imports uh, from Russia with the fact that it, um, its its uh, population, in contrast to Europe, uh, cannot afford increasing uh, oil prices, cannot afford uh, increasing commodity prices, and that has been um, a a important. Um, an important way of of of, what, of of explaining how and why India uh, has uh, important much more oil, and I think uh, the sensitivities in India uh, regarding price shocks and regarding um, uh, um, international up upheals and wars are are simply very high. And uh, if you talk to uh, foreign policy experts in India, it is. Very interesting how um, how these um, these topics, how these challenges of, of economic and social development, are are at the forefront of, of how they how they see how they understand uh, their foreign policy. This view this might differ maybe if you talk to policymakers, maybe there are other aspects might be um, more important. Uh, but in the discussion with with people from think tanks, this is very much at the forefront of how of how they um, of how they frame India's foreign policy. 
Mm, that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's do some questions. Brian, I want to go back to you and hit those three scenarios that I, I mentioned earlier. You talk about the potential future world being fragmented, diverse, or antagonistic. Now, none of those are exactly rosy scenarios. Um, and oddly, antagonistic seems to be the most likely and also perhaps the most positive. But could you <laughs> run through the three of those and, and how, you, how you came to those three options? Yes, these are three scenarios that Zhao Huasheng outlined in a chapter. He's a, a well-known China expert on Russia, and I got to know him uh, during my time doing research in China. He's at Fudan University in Shanghai. And uh, I, I like his writing because he's always very clear about um, his, his ideas and his, his concepts. And uh, so in a fragmented order, basically no state would be willing or able to provide order in the way that the United States has done since the end of World War II. And so this could lead to fragmentation and it would be more like world disorder than, than order. And we could see some of that, I think, in the future. There could be certain aspects of, of international politics where no country is, is providing leadership if the United States were to withdraw and, and be unable to play that leadership role. But I, I think that power abhors a vacuum and, it, and if, um, if the world became fragmented, eventually someone would fill the void and that's most likely to be China. I think they would, would step in and, and impose their ideas of order in many different ways. And so I don't think fragmentation would last for long. A diverse world order, as Zhao Huasheng describes it, would be like multipolarity, like China and Russia call for. And what they always say is in a multipolar world, uh, every country could have its own uh, domestic political system and development path, and all countries would respect other countries' uh, own choices in those areas. They wouldn't criticize domestic affairs in the other countries, and it would be kind of a live and let live system. Uh, and it and it sounds appealing in certain ways, but there are a number of problems with it. Uh, first of all, China and Russia talk about the importance of state sovereignty, uh, but they appear to view that as the prerogative of great powers, uh, not of uh, smaller powers around them. And so if the United States were to accept this kind of order that China and Russia propose, it would mean accepting expansive Chinese and Russian spheres of influence which would be, of course, counter to, to the idea of a liberal international order and would also have uh, major security implications because the United States has, has always tried to prevent any single power from dominating the key regions of the world. And if China were to establish a, a sphere of influence in Asia, that would be counter to that objective. And it would also require uh, pulling back a lot on uh, democracy promotion and, and human rights promotion, and it, and it would mean sort of going along with Chinese and Russian efforts to weaken international <clears throat> human rights norms, and that's something that liberal democracies can't accept. And so, and also, uh, I, I think in an interconnected world, different types of order aren't going to be able to exist independently in their own geographic spheres. They'll be clashing all of the, all of the time. There will be a constant contest to set the rules and norms of, of the world order. And so I, I, I don't think that uh, this type of diverse order is, is a really realistic option. And so probably an, an antagonistic order, as I already described, uh, uh, is the most likely outcome in which uh, the U.S.-China rivalry becomes more intense and both countries uh, organize their partnerships and, uh, with other countries uh, for the purposes of security co uh, competition with the other. And it will be like the Cold War in certain ways, but also different uh, in the sense that during the Cold War, there was minimal economic interaction between the two blocs. Of course, it's very, a very different world now. Uh, China's economy is closely interlinked with economies around the world. There could be uh, some areas of decoupling, as, as uh, Sophie discusses in, in her chapter, but the economic interlinkages are likely to main, remain pretty strong for quite a while. And so that will greatly complicate the situation. And as I said, it will require uh, efforts to, to manage economic and other issues. Uh, so it, the, the coming world order uh, is, is likely to be antagonistic, I think, in that respect, and um, similar in certain ways to the Cold War, but also different in, in key respects.
Yeah. I mean, it sounds like what we talk about in Washington a lot is the strategic competition atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and the, the diverse label, I think, really does suck you in. It's like, oh, well, that, that sounds very pleasant. Mm-hmm. But then as you lay out the implications of that and all that the U.S. and its allies and those who believe in democracy and personal freedoms would have to accept, it becomes very clear very quickly that, no, this is not the outcome we're really looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds like uh, diversity on China's terms is what we're really mm-hmm. talking about, mm-hmm. which is not something that, you know, I'm personally interested in. Uh, we have an audience question. Does Russia's preoccupation with the war offer new possibilities for other regional powers to strengthen their ties with Russia's neighbors? It's an interesting question, too, because we've seen, you know, the implications for NATO, additional members wanting to join. Um, you know, Putin's idea of pushing back against NATO influence seems to have totally backfired. How do you see the, the strategic implications of Russia being preoccupied in Ukraine? Well, as I said, I just returned from a trip to Central Asia, and this was a, a, a major topic of discussion there. Uh, it, it does seem that Russia's influence in that region has been weakened a little bit, and it has given some room for the Central Asian countries to assert themselves in certain ways. Uh, Kazakhstan in particular, which shares a long border with Russia, is concerned about Russia's intentions. They look at what Russia is doing in Ukraine and, and worry that uh, Russia could put some, some, that kind of pressure on Kazakhstan. And so uh, Kazakhstan and, and the other Central Asian countries have not endorsed Russia's uh, actions in, in Ukraine, and they've uh, taken the opportunity to try to carve out a little bit more space for themselves. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is that the, uh, the new power in that region is China. Uh, and uh, China offers certain opportunities to them in terms of uh, investment and so forth. Uh, but uh, they're also concerned about the implications of growing Chinese influence. So uh, that, uh, that seems to be a good example of a case in which Russia's preoccupation with the, the war in Ukraine has, has caused its influence in a key region to weaken somewhat. Uh, for example, Russia uh, is, uh, bases its claim to continued power in that region on playing the, the main security role. But uh, in some key conflicts recently, fighting between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan last fall, and a little bit further afield, renewed fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan around the same time, Russia wasn't really able to step in and, and play a, a role of, of bringing peace. And so that calls into question its long-term role as a security provider. Uh, whereas China is getting a little bit more involved in regional security, especially along its western border. So, uh, so that's one region that's, that's on my mind, and so I'll uh, focus on that in, in my answer to the question. But uh, uh, there are, of course, all kinds of implications for, for many countries along Russia's periphery uh, from this war, and, and they'll be uh, looking at their alignment very closely in the coming period. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it does show the, the interconnectedness of all of these conflicts. I think a theme sort of running through the report is that Pacific security and European security are not going on in two different hemispheres, that they are deeply connected. Um, I think you make it in your chapter, and I think you also make it in your chapter. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that European and Pacific security is is intertwined? And we hear a lot, especially in D.C. right now, about this debate, well, can we do both? Can we do Pacific security and European mm-hmm. security? Um, in my mind, it's a false dichotomy, but what do you think? Yes, this is, of course, the big question here in Washington right now. And it's uh, a, an issue that I looked at carefully in the past two, edition, uh, pa- past two editions of Strategic Trends, when I looked at uh, China-Russia relations and the security implications for uh, the transatlantic partnership two years ago, and then for Asian security in last year's edition. And uh, it's, it's true, the 2018 National Defense Strategy of the United States essentially acknowledged that it would be very, very difficult, if not impossible, for the United States to fight Russia and China simultaneously. Uh, it calls for uh, uh, trying to defeat one great power adversary at a time while still having the ability to deter another, uh, but not necessarily to defeat two at the same time. And so uh, this poses huge challenges. And there are uh, different ideas for, for how to address this. Uh, but it, it's uh, certainly an issue in, in the war in Ukraine. How far can the United States go in helping Ukraine without jeopardizing its ability to defend Taiwan, for example? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, uh, the, the U.S. support for Ukraine has burned through munitions supplies at a, at a rapid rate, and it's going to take a while for the defense industry to, to build up stockpiles again. And so these are 
are um, burning questions that uh, are going to be debated for, for quite some time. Uh, there are different ideas kicked around, like uh, being able to fight one great power adversary at a time while at least being able to support a, a proxy in fighting another. That's, that's one idea that's, that's been discussed. But of course, the, the Elbridge-Colby view is that uh, the, in, the entire focus has to be on China because of the threats from China and Russia, China is the greater threat. And if, if, um, if, if you look at his arguments, it, of course, it's difficult to, to rebut them. Uh, but at the same time, I, I do think that if if the United States can successfully help Ukraine and help uh, achieve an outcome that is uh, relatively more favorable for Ukraine, relatively less favorable for Russia, that that uh, does have uh, the effect of chastening China to some extent and probably weakening, possibly weakening to some extent the China-Russia partnership. If Russia were to achieve a very favorable outcome, then we would expect the China-Russia relationship to get closer and China to be emboldened. And so it's desirable, I think, to help help Ukraine. But there are, of course, big questions about the capability of the United States to do both. And I, I don't have the definitive answer today. No, I don't think anybody has the no. definitive answer, period. <laughs> uh, Bridges' book was, I think, um, usefully provocative in trying to solicit this argument and <clears throat> talk about you know, what the U.S.'s priorities really should be. Um, in my mind, it's a false choice that the, the kinds of weaponry that we would need to defend Taiwan is different than the kinds of weaponry we need in Ukraine. Um, so supporting one doesn't weaken us that much against the other and certainly sends the strong message about rolling back authoritarian aggression. Um, but, you know, money is money is money and all of these weapons are expensive. So there is that that follow up point as well. Um, Naveen, did you want to add anything on that point about the, the interconnectedness of, of these calculations and, and NATO versus uh, the way that things are moving in the Pacific? Yes, definitely. And I also wouldn't uh, frame it as a versus, uh, rather an and. I think uh, there is this change, I think, in mentality uh, among allies uh, in Europe and in Asia, uh, understanding a bit more how uh, the U.S. Uh, is perhaps going to have to be managing and balancing uh, two different regions much more simultaneously uh, than it has before, and that there could be these uh, crises happening, uh, not one after the other, but more in parallel. I think uh, this a realization is coming now at, from the highest levels, like Kishida, uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, said it himself, that the security of Europe and of the Indo-Pacific is inseparable and I think this has been reiterated a lot in public statements and also obviously in Australia and I, this realization comes also uh, within NATO countries who are seeking to uh, through NATO but also bilaterally through their Indo-Pacific strategies and others to reinforce links. Um, I think there's sometimes often a lot of lessons learned of the war in Asia that draw too many conclusions that are not as you say, what happens in Ukraine won't necessarily happen in Taiwan and uh, China uh, sees this situation very differently. But for allies, at least, uh, there is a, a refocus of trying to be aware of what's happening, trying to increase dialogue, understanding, and more importantly, for them to uh, fill uh, conventional capability gaps to ensure that there is uh, no imbalance and that the credibility of deterrence is assured in both regions. And I think uh, in, most, in some countries, this has been going on for some time, just an uh, increase of defense spending and of pushing uh, this. And in others, uh, again, we're see seeing this a lot more acutely um, in, in the last few years. This just need to uh, make sure to compensate conventionally uh, and compensate where they can, where the US cannot, for instance. Yeah, thank you. A um, couple more audience questions. We've got about five more minutes left, so if you want to get your questions in, get them in now. Um, how will the war in Ukraine affect India's economic growth? That's a very short question, but there's a lot packed in there. Boaz, you want to take a stab at it? Uh, I can try. <laughs> um, so I think uh, India's uh, economic trajectory is very much affected by the general uh, global economic outlook. 
And to the extent of how much the war will continue uh, to affect the, the global economic trajectory to the same extent or to a similar extent, India's uh, economy will also be uh, affected. So India, uh, count or one of India's growth strategies is uh, to, 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 to count on or to to, to do exports and of course in, in this regard that could be uh, uh, there could be uh, some um, challenges ahead. Uh, if uh, on the other hand the war in Ukraine uh, might also accelerate uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, how this also affects China uh, Russia relations uh, if that has an impact on how much supply chains, for instance, uh, whether or not they will be, they will try, will be try to uh, um, looking for other locations sooner, that might also be, of course, a positive impact for India. But I think here are a lot of question marks, and it is very, uh, very difficult to answer uh, this question at the moment, but I think uh, one of the decisive or one of the important aspects is, of course, the, the general uh, global economic outlook that will impact uh, India's uh, economic trajectory. Yeah. I mean, a definite theme of this report is the complexity of this current global order and the moment of a bit of uncertainty. And I think that plays out, you know, with everything that happens in Ukraine having global implications. Um, Brian, I'm going to give you the last word, but I'm selfishly going to try and squeeze two questions into that last word. Um, first of all, you talk in your chapter about the potential emergence of a Sinocentric world order. And I want you to sort of paint that picture for us a little bit. What do you think that looks like in China's mind? Um, and then also, if you could just conclude with what changed? You've done this for several years in a row now. Uh, what do you see as the difference between last year's report and this year's report? Sure. On, <clears throat> on the issue of a Sinocentric world order, I think in, in China's view, it probably starts with, as I said, uh, revising the, the regional order in East Asia so that China is at the head of a, a regional hierarchy. And then uh, building influence around the world, especially in the global south and other parts of the world, to undermine U.S. efforts to, uh, in, in China's view, contain China's rise. Uh, China wants to have enough partnerships around the world that uh, would severely complicate that for the United States, and also to um, oppose the idea of a, a liberal or rules-based international order. So China would build worldwide influence. Uh, it's doing that through infrastructure investment and and uh, and other uh, and, and diplomatic initiatives and so forth. And it would uh, gain leadership in important sectors of the world economy, and speci especially in technology, that would give it the power to set rules, norms, and, and standards. And so, and then sort of build out from that, I think. So it's kind of push back and, and squeeze back on the U.S.-led order and, and the U.S. Uh, alliances and, and partnerships and to weaken those around the world. Uh, as I said, it wants to break the U.S. alliance network in Asia. It's also trying to drive a wedge between the United States and Europe at present in order to pre uh, prevent the emergence of a united transatlantic front against China. So uh, through all of those efforts, I think it, it, it's trying to essentially weaken the U.S.-led international order, expand its influence around the world, not with the aim of directly ruling the world, but uh, but having um, sort of uh, almost something like the old conception of the emperor being at the center and, and not ruling the, uh, everything on the periphery, but at least expecting deference from countries on the periphery. Mm. So I think it, it looks something, something like that. And so as far as uh, <clears throat> what has changed, well, uh, two years ago I, I wrote about uh, – uh, China-Russia relations and implications for transatlantic security. And at that time, I didn't envision a, a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so that's that's been the big change. And that happened in the middle of writing last year's issue. So we had to uh, <laughs> Start make, <over. laughs> make some major changes. Uh, so, of course, that's been the big change. The, the, the war in Ukraine and its... Uh, 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 revealed a lot of things about the world, you know, the the uh, uh, the 
I, on, on the one hand, the, the effect that uh, transatlantic cooperation can have and cooperation among liberal democracies can have, as in, its, as in the support for Ukraine, but also ways in which not all of the world buys into that, those efforts, and mm -hmm. they're going to look out for their own interests. And as Boaz describes, uh, India has its own set of calculations. So all of this has, has clarified a lot of things about the world, and it's... Um, uh, there is concern that, that Russia's war in Ukraine could be sort of like the opening salvo in a long-term um, contest over, over world order. And so I, I would say that's the big changes, and that's the big change, and we're still sorting out the implications of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a sea change for uh, a lot of different dynamics around the world, and I know that our, our colleagues in Europe feel it very close to home. Mm -hmm. um, I think Zelensky's trip this week shows that the, the unity continues, and that's going to be our, our greatest strength going forward. Oh, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, Brian, for you for coming across the Atlantic, and to your colleagues for, for coming to us virtually. It is a gorgeous day in Washington, D.C., <laughs> so I wish you were both here to enjoy it. Um, I appreciate the report very much. I appreciate the collaboration between our two organizations, and I, I hope it continues in the future, because as you point out, you know, the alliances are what are really going to carry us through. So thank you very much, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.